Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your providence that your church may joyfully serve you in quiet and confidence and godly peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Old Testament reading from Genesis chapter 3, verses 121. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We might eat of the free fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, he said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust, and you shall eat the dust you shall eat in all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. This is the word of the Lord. Epistles reading this morning is uh, from 2 Corinthians 4, 13 to 18. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us 
with you into his presence, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comp comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. They each went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. 
the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test them, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. The Gospel of the Lord. Do have a seat for a moment. Actually, could I could I be a pain? Could I borrow? Is there one of those around? Uh, the the lectern thing. Sorry, I've just changed my. If there's one, I can. Thank you. Sorry, I'm. I actually can't. From in my country, I'm a giant. Actually, I came to America, <laughs> but this this is a bit high. I'm just, I feel like I've disappeared outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that's better. That is better. Sorry, I was standing up there and feeling like I completely disappeared out of sight. Oh, it is good to be with you this morning. It is good to be with you. It's good to be with you in God's presence this morning. Thank you for bringing back the summer. This is lovely. How nice. We had some sunshine. I do recognize, I do recognize uh, that it has been a really challenging season. Uh, there hasn't been a day, I think, since, well, I've prayed for you constantly before things got a little challenging, but not a day since... December, I think well, I've not prayed for you earnestly. Um, but it is a season in which Jesus is very much present and has promised to be present. Never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. And he is so very faithful. And I see signs of his presence everywhere. I want to thank Father Ray and Father Malcolm for their extraordinary faithful care and shepherding of you all. Uh, we are so blessed to have them in the diocese. You're so blessed to have them in this family. I want to thank the wardens and the vestry for all their hard work. There was a recent communication, not this weekend, weekend before, where they laid out a formidable list of folk who were kind of standing up and, you know, uh, stepping up and um, doing all kinds of jobs, all kinds of work. So thank you uh, for all the work there. I want to thank Dan McKinley. Um, thank you, Dan, for keeping us in the presence of God and singing his praises. Thank you for your ministry here. The, uh, the first opening hymn this morning was the first hymn of my wedding, so that just really blessed me. You weren't to know that, but thank you. It just really blessed me. Um, I was also I was so blessed to see the Imago Stage Company's production, um, or not to see, to, to hear of, the account of Monte Cristo. I think it's wonderful that is going on. How incredibly clever to do an audio production in the times of COVID. Um, so wonderful. I, I have an audio ticket. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm going to. And I also understand that Karen Williamson, after her recent uh, women's Bible study, uh, which was not for the faint-hearted, Eleanor took participate in it, if any of you were part of it, it was a very thorough, uh, very wonderful study. And she is getting ready to do another one in the fall. My secret plan for Karen's life, and I, I say it publicly now, maybe she'll hear, I think she's in Charleston at the moment, is that this may be something that we can use across the whole of the, the, the diocese, but um, I'll just kind of sneak that in now and hope that Karen is agreeable because it's a wonderful resource. So this is a season of transition. It is a season of discernment uh, in search for a new rector for CTR. Uh, but it's not a holding pattern. It's not a holding pattern in the life and the presence of Jesus in this church family. Let me put it this way, very briefly. Uh, my wife loves tapas food. You know, the Spanish, the little plates loves tapas food. You know, we've enjoyed tapas in Spain. We have cookbooks on tapas. 
lots of beautifully seasoned, small plates of delicious, savory food that just kind of keep coming. And I enjoyed these meals very much too, but I confess that I still have this kind of lingering feeling for the main course. I'm kind of like, but when is the main course happening? And then, you know, the little cheese and olive pastries are delicious, but when is the main course going to arrive? And I even find myself holding back, you know, because of, in the anticipation of a main course. Um, and at the end of the meal, I realize, you know what, I should have just enjoyed it all. I should have had the extra cheese and olive pastry thing. I wonder if I'm inclined to live a little bit like that. How much do we miss out on because we're waiting for the main course to arrive? We say to ourselves, you know what, well, when COVID is over, when I start my new job, when I retire, when the winter is done, when the summer allergies have disappeared, when we find our new rector, then, and I think the danger is that we pass on all the good things that God is sending our way because we think there's some kind of main course imminently coming and we miss what God is holding out for us. We miss the joy that he's holding out for us. And we worship Jesus who does not waste anybody's time. And every season that Jesus brings into our lives is, if you like, the main course. Every day is the main course. Whatever is going on in our lives right now is as full of his presence as any season in our lives. And where his presence is, there is joy. In your presence is fullness of joy, David wrote. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. That's Psalm 16. So this morning, on this beautiful summer's morning, I want to seize the day and remember the presence of Jesus with us and simply preach the gospel. I want to preach the gospel this morning. My heart is recently been captured by John chapter 8, which is why there was that if you notice, there was a little bit of a, a switch in what was on your bulletin and, what's on, and what was read uh, by Deacon Scott. So in departure from the advertised program, I would like to unpack John chapter 8. I'd like to bring us into the presence of Jesus, and I would like us to behold again the fullness of his love and his mercy over all of us. Does that sound like a plan? I'll take that as a yes. Okay, let us pray. Lord Jesus... I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for the sun streaming in through these windows. And I pray, Father, that your presence would soak and fill our hearts. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would be so present to us this morning and that by your spirit you would open what probably is to many of us a familiar scripture, but breathe on, breathe on it afresh and breathe on our hearts afresh that we may behold the fullness of your grace and your love and your mercy over each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there's a gentleman, he's an author, he's, a, he's Dr. Edward Welch. Uh, Father Ray may have come across him. He's a counselor and faculty member at the Christian Counseling and Education Foundation. And in his doctoral studies on neuropsychology, he sat before a class and he asked them, have you ever experienced shame? Nobody put their hand up. Absolute silence. He thought about it. This is strange. So he came at it another way. He asked a second question. He said, okay, have any of you ever experienced debilitating shame? Every single hand in the room went up. There is, if you like, appropriate shame. There's a remorse or a shame that, that carries this godly quality, godly sorrow, and it takes us closer to God. That's a, a good kind of sorrow, I guess. Well, it is. But there's also a second kind of shame that is very, very toxic and highly debilitating, and it moves us further away from God. There's no one definition of toxic shame, but it distinguishes itself by this deep sense that we are unacceptable, that something that we did or something that was done to us or something associated to us leaves us feeling uh, less than human, or perhaps we were treated less than human. It's very pervasive. It stalks in disguise beneath a myriad of other problems. So anger and fear and guilt are all kind of held by this kind of toxic shame. It attaches and embeds itself within our souls. Uh, we, we, we come to believe it's the, the truth about us. 
Um, and it's very adept at actually sounding like our own voice. It bombards us with images of being an outsider, of being naked, unclean. It's exactly the kind of shame that caused Adam and Eve to go and hide in the garden. It's that sort. Did it bring them closer to God? No, it sent them into the woods to hide out. It's, um, if you like, there's something very public about shame. Guilt can be hidden. Shame feels like it is or is about to be publicly exposed. It's not a mirage, it's very real. Wishful thinking, self-affirmation, medication, alcohol, a change of scene, new job, none of this will fix toxic shame. Shame demands something much more potent than any superficial remedy. So, we come to the gospel story this morning. Let me set up the story for you. Early in the morning, Jesus has gone to the temple. Um, the crowds have discovered him. And so he's sitting down, as in the, the rabbinical tradition, to teach them. And the scene is interrupted. The scribes and the Pharisees push this poor woman before Jesus with the accusation that she's been caught in the act of adultery. And the scene is wretched and utterly shameful. Here is a shame that is publicly exposed, naked, unclean. It's so toxic. It strips this woman of all her humanity. It says that she has no value save but to satisfy the law and the bloodlust of the crowd. And we know Deuteronomy 22, verse 22 says, in cases of proven adultery, clearly what is called for is the mandatory death penalty. So how does Jesus respond to this woman's shame? And it's a really important question because in her story and in Jesus' response, we find our story and our freedom and healing in Jesus Christ. So, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. So he writes twice on the ground with his finger. There are very rare moments in the Bible where, where, it's, where it's described as God writing with his finger on the ground. And um, it, it's, it's, it's curious because this is the only moment when Jesus is recorded as actually writing something. We have, we have the prayers that he said, we have, but this is the only moment in the Gospels where it actually says he wrote anything down. We don't actually know what he wrote. Various theories. Perhaps Jesus is playing for time. I think that might be me. Maybe he's deep in thought or prayer. I, I heard recently someone suggested that he was actually writing down the names of other people in the crowd who committed adultery. I mean, it's kind of an interesting theory. I'm not sure, but it's an interesting theory. I think actually there's something much more deliberate going on here. There are two specific instances in the Bible where God is described as writing with his finger. First is Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13, it says, Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. So that's the first. Second is Daniel, King Belshazzar's palace. If you remember, the hand appears. There's this feast going on. And in, and in a very um, idolatrous way, they're actually drinking uh, in a in a wrong way from the, the cups that would have been the mercy cups from the temple. It's a kind of, this is not a good moment. Um, and the hand appears um, and there's writing on the wall. Do you remember what Walton, Belshazzar's feast? Dan, Dan will know that. You know, nobody knows that piece of music, it's awesome. It's, that's a big moment in that work. <laughs> um, and Daniel interrupts, he interprets, he says, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And so here's the thing. Jesus' action in writing with his finger on the sand is a parabolic action that the Pharisees would have understood. It says, Daniel 5, 6, then the king's color changed and, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. So that's, that's the effect in Belshazzar's palace. Much the same reaction is now going on in this crowd because Jesus is communicating to her accusers you are those of whom these scriptures speak. That's what he's saying, this parabolic action. You know, we, we explore this, we find the scriptures and we go, oh my gosh, look at that. For, for the Pharisees, they wouldn't know this. 
the moment his finger touched the soil, touched the sand, they would know what Jesus was pointing to. And he is saying, you are those of whom these scriptures speak. He need not have written the scriptures out in full on the sand. The gesture was more than enough. And in writing on the sand, Jesus is silencing their accusation. He is meeting her accuser's judgment with judgment. He is rejecting their unforgiveness and their mercilessness. And the Pharisees might be saying, well, look, we're just being faithful to the law. It's what it says, Deuteronomy chapter 22. We're just being faithful to the law. Jesus is saying, if you really knew the law, if you truly knew the heart of God, you would find mercy and not condemnation. And we see this throughout the whole Bible. You look in the book of Hosea, um, there's God's rebuke of his people, this kind of scandalous infidelity. Israel is actually referred to as an unfaithful spouse. And yet, in the face of this heartbreaking unfaithfulness, the Lord says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. That's Hosea 14, 49. James' voice within us has a very, very predictable script. You can pretty much tell it immediately. It's very boring, and it's, it's the same script the enemy used in the garden. And basically, it says, you never were any good, you are no good, and you never will be any good. It's kind of a variation on those things. Only ever those three things. And in the healing of toxic shame, Jesus will always begin by silencing that voice of condemnation. There's another uh, example of this, Joshua the high priest, not the Joshua that was with Moses, another one a bit later. And there's a, Zechariah has a, um, a vision of Joshua the high priest standing, and the enemy is at his side accusing, and the impression is that Joshua has no word of defense, and so his kind of head is hung low, and the enemy is pounding him, and this, and this, and this, and this. And the Lord's first and immediate response is extraordinary. It says, and the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. In other words, be quiet. And at that moment, the enemy is completely silent. Jesus will always derail the enemy's accusations. And in the silence, in the silence, he will then lead us into mercy. So the first thing here is that he silences the accusation. It's what Jesus does with this woman. It's what we see through the Bible. And in that silence, he leads this woman into mercy. So we read on. Jesus straightened up and said to the crowd, let any one of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until it was only Jesus left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. How does Jesus free us from our shame? He interrupts her accusers, calls judgment upon their judgment, and then he chooses to stand with us. If you look at this gospel and you kind of almost keep your finger on where is Jesus and this woman in this story. If you kind of just watch physically where if you were setting it as a play, where where is Jesus and the woman? Where where do they stand? Jesus is always standing at this woman's side. There's not one moment where he kind of steps away or steps back or pushes her away. He is always at her side. Initially he shields her from the condemnation. He actually places his own life in peril by standing closely to her. And as the crowd move away, now it's just Jesus and this woman standing together. And you can imagine the scene, there are kind of just rocks discarded, kind of the dust is settling, there's this eerie kind of silence. And Jesus asks her a question. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? You've got to kind of ask yourself the question, why would he ask the question that he already knows the answer to? Why, why would he do that? Well, in this moment, what Jesus is doing in asking her the obvious question, if you like, is that he's making space 
so that she might see the largeness of what is going on here. She says, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. No matter what you have ever heard about God, this is his heart right here. No matter what anyone has ever told you, or taught you, or you've read, or you've heard, this, this is the heart of God right here. It's like this fine grain that, that, that runs through this piece of polished oak, if you like. It doesn't go this way or that way, it goes this way. And the way it runs is mercy, leading right up to the cross. It's said, actually, that the moment Eve put her teeth into that apple, Jesus began his slow walk to the cross. Mercy. Just five words. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus is the only one in the crowd without sin. He's the only one who could legitimately have cast the first stone. He's the one who chooses not to condemn her, but to stand with her, to shield her, and to forgive her. And it's worth remembering that this is God incarnate that is standing with this woman. He is the embodiment of all that is holy. I, he is the I am who met Moses at Mount Sinai. And he now stands before this proven adulterer and says, I do not condemn you. And this, this is the radical, scandalous mercy of our God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. John 3.17. At the very heart of God is mercy. Shame is absolutely merciless. It, the enemy will cherry pick our lives and thrash us with those moments that we'd rather forget. I can, I can be walking down the street and remember something that I wish I hadn't said or a moment where I should have said something and I didn't say something or something I did or didn't do and I can, it will actually make me physically kind of groan out loud as I remember it. And we imagine when, we, when those moments kind of come at our hearts that God feels the same way about us as we do. That somehow if all this came to light, Jesus would throw up his arms in disgust and reject us because that is my response for myself. But the truth is, he does throw open his arms, but not to reject us, but to embrace us. On the cross, Paul reminds us how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. It's Hebrews 9.14. So Jesus silences our accuser, and in the silence, he speaks his word of mercy. And then finally, he exchanges his life for her life. When Jesus declares, go now and leave your life of sin, this statement is not a threat. It's an invitation that is offered in love. It's an invitation that allows for the freely given love that Jesus has just lavished on her to permeate the whole of her existence and her relationship with God and others. It's a love that now radically changes her identity. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, has this woman ever been really loved for who she is? Has she ever been really loved for the person that God made her to be? Certainly her lover here is absent, and actually the law deemed him to be equally culpable. So where's he? For the scribes and the Pharisees, she's just a pawn in their game to bring Jesus down. Raniero Cantamalasa, who is the preacher to the papal household, wrote this of, this, of this part of John's Gospel. He wrote, Jesus came especially to redeem human beings from this situation, to manifest to them how much they are loved for themselves, freely, without any preconditions. Jesus reveals to her that he does not love her the way others have, that is, to possess her or use her like refuse. He makes a gift of love wholly directed toward her, to recover her identity as a beloved child of God, the way the Father always made her to be. How does Jesus accomplish this? 
Well, in the supremacy of his love, he took upon himself the burden of her sin and the torment of her shame, and she walked in freedom into new life, and he went to the cross. We offer just a final thought. I wonder how it all worked out for her in the end. How, how, how did her life kind of go on? How, how, how did this all work out? Well, we can't be sure, but Jesus does actually give us this little insight. It's just a hint. He's speaking to a Pharisee named Simon, and Jesus says this. He says, two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Only the love and mercy of God has the power to transform us from the inside out. Her new life is not forged upon her now living a perfect sinless life. It's pretty unlikely, I would imagine, that that was how the story transpired. I'm sure she made other mistakes as life went on. But what was transformed was her heart that would always, in love, lead her back to the mercy of God, where yet another piece of her heart is transformed. Love compels her to accept her new freedom. Love compels her again and again and again to step into God's mercy, that she might continue to walk in the freedom. When I, um, when I first came to faith, I was in my kind of mid-twenties, so I wasn't, I wasn't an old man, but I kind of lived enough, I guess. And, and actually, initially, um, initially, I was just incredibly uh, overwhelmed that Jesus was real and knew my name, that those were the two things that hit me first in my encounter with Jesus. He's real, and he knows my name. And then about a week or so later, it dawned on me that having got to my mid-twenties, there were many things in my past that I really wish had not been there. And there was a particular, a particular kind of season that I just, uh, just couldn't shake the sense of shame and guilt over. It just, just was in my heart like lead shot, you know? And I, I prayed. I knew the theory. I, I, I mean, I, was, I, I had some good Christian people around me, and I knew that if I prayed and if I asked forgiveness, the Lord would forgive me. But somehow it didn't seem to kind of settle in my heart. I still dragged this kind of lead shot around in, 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 inside of me on this, these particular circumstances. So this is what I, where I was in my, my faith journey. And, uh, and at that point, I was driving to the office in the morning. I was, I was still uh, an attorney, and I had this 40-minute car journey. And if I do say so myself, I would prepare the most splendid worship services in this 40-minute car journey. I, these were the days of cassette tapes. Some of us will remember those, remember? And, uh, and I had uh, you know, worship music and hymns, and I would have speakers from all over the world. It was fabulous, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I, on one of these worship services in the privacy of my own car, uh, I remember a, a preacher telling a story. And he shared how he'd taken his team uh, his leaders, and it would be his, his vestry and, and, and his staff team, to a conference. And during the conference, they'd been invited. It was a healing prayer kind of conference. And, and at the end of the conference, that team was invited to come forward. And the person who was leading the conference uh, prayed for each of the, 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 his team. And he described this very kind of wonderful, kind of beautiful, overwhelming moment in the Lord where the priest that was praying for them had very specific words of knowledge that he just poured over each one. And as he prayed along the line, their hearts just broke and there were tears because God met them in such a, a personal way through those prayers. Well, the poor woman who was right at the end, who's a member of this team, was in agony because it was described that there was this moment in her life that she was deeply regretful of, had asked the Lord to forgive her over and over again, and yet she carried it around in her heart, this sense of shame she just could not be free of. And that caught my attention. I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, I understand. Um, and she felt, oh gosh, these, these prayers are so beautiful and so accurate. The Lord is really ministering and speaking to his people. When it comes to me, this is going to be the moment that I always dreaded. This is going to be the moment where, quite rightly, 
my shame will be publicly exposed. This is the moment where I get everything that I know should properly be coming to me. This is the moment I have always feared. So the man is making his way steadily down the line. More and more beautiful prayers have been prayed over each member of the team, more tears. People are overwhelmed that Jesus could speak so personally to them in that moment, closer and closer. She's thinking, this is the moment. This is the moment I have always feared and always dreaded. So finally, the priest comes to this poor woman and puts his hand on her shoulder. And he says, oh, my child, there is something in your life that you feel so ashamed of. And although you've brought it to the Lord so many times for his forgiveness, you just cannot shake the shame of, of, of this moment. And she thought, there we are. This is it. This is where it's going to be publicly exposed. And so it should be because it's exactly what I deserve. This is the moment of ruination and shame that I have always feared. And here it is. And the priest continued, you have always, you have always, uh, of, of, and you have always feared. You have always feared this. Um, but of that moment that you have carried with such dread and shame in your heart, the Lord would say this to you. There was a silence. The priest said, I don't remember it. I don't remember it. Hebrews, I will forgive their sins and remember them no more. I was so impacted by this moment, which I was tracking with this woman. I think I almost put the hut of the car in a hedge. I was... <laughs> Just this slobbery, drooly mess. I don't remember it. That is the scandal of the grace of God. It is completely scandalous. But it's what Jesus did for us on the cross. I don't remember it. I remember saying to the Lord, but you know everything. How can you possibly say you don't remember it? You know everything. Just very quietly I felt the Lord say, well, I choose not to remember it. That made sense. I choose, in his love and in his mercy, I choose not to remember it. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Our freedom in Christ is formed by living in response to the love and the mercy of God. It's a love that will always lead us back to his mercy. That time and time and time again, the Lord will stand at our side, silence the accuser, Forgive us our sin, heal us, and set us free from the bondage of shame. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us now. Lord Jesus, I pray that by your Spirit, in the fullness of your love and mercy, you would fill our hearts with a love that is distinguished by freedom and hope a lightness that comes to us, that you have us, that you are holding us, that you walk with us, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. Come, Holy Spirit of God. Renew our hearts in the fullness of your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. So why don't we stand and as people with clean hearts and clean hands declare our faith to our God in the words of the creed. So, let's say together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all beings were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you like to kneel or be seated as we continue? Let us pray for the church and the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, Andrew Williams, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and the people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joe Biden, our president, and Charlie Baker, our governor. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit.
We want to welcome you here to Christ the Redeemer on this uh, wonderful Sunday morning. You came at the right time because the temperature is going to be higher as we go along. We welcome our bishop with us today and Elena, we thank you, you can be with us. And then uh, Canon Ross, we're always glad to see you. Just a few announcements. Redeemer prayer meeting will be on Tuesday night in the prayer chapel, which is the baptistry at the rear of the church from 7.30 to 8.30. <clears throat> All are welcome and we hope that you might be there to join with us in prayer. Some of you know Father Roger Wooten, who many of you remember from Christ Chapel. He died of old age recently. His funeral is on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. at St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church in Stoneham. Father Leas will be the officiant, and Dan McKinley will be the organist. There'll be a coffee hour following our service today. We invite you to join us in the parish hall at the conclusion of the service. For receiving the Eucharist today, we invite you to go come down the center aisle to receive the Eucharist and then go back the other way. O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O oh Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. 
All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints to the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. And for those joining us online, uh, please join uh, in praying for spiritual communion. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every altar of your church. And I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated.
so we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for showing us these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.